Oh, good evening, everyone. Sego ani buju endio wachea kwekwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So uh, we were meeting in Committee of the Whole uh, closed uh, meeting. We did discuss uh, a number of items, including uh, the uh, Kingston Professional Firefighters Association negotiated settlement, uh, the Ontario Land Tribunal process, the Waterloo encampment decision, uh, Leon Center contract negotiations, updates and next steps, and also employment lands. So I will propose that we will rise from Committee of the Whole closed session, report out, and then reconvene after our open session this evening. So Madam Deputy Clerk, if I could have a motion to, uh, to waive our rules and have the clerk report, please. Certainly. Moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Tozo, that Council rise from the Committee of the Whole closed meeting, that the rules of bylaw number 2021-41 be waived, that the City Clerk report, and the Council resolve back into Committee of the Whole closed meeting immediately prior to the consideration of bylaws to complete the agenda. All those in favour? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Tozo, uh, that Council ratify the collective agreement and authorize the Mayor and Clerk to execute the agreement between the Corporation of the City of Kingston and the Kingston Professional Firefighters Association for the period of January 1, 2023 to December 31, 2025. All those in favour? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, so moving on to the approval of the added, we have uh, three delegations and two motions of condolence. Can I have a mover and then seconder for the added, please? Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Amos. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, we have no presentations this evening, so we will move to our three delegations. Uh, so first, I will invite Asabi Foxen, who will appear before Council to speak to new motion number one with respect to No Mo May. Just a reminder to all of our delegations that you have uh, five minutes to speak, and then I will open up the floor to questions from members of Council. Ms. Foxen, welcome, and you have the floor. Uh, Ms. Foxen, I believe you're on mute. I am on mute. Thank you. Uh, good evening and thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Um, through you, Chair, I would like to thank Councillor Tozo and others for their help and encouragement. I am really proud to be a resident of Kingston with this council at the helm. I'm here in my capacity as a Rotarian, a gardener, and a grandmother, and an immigrant who really wants to give back to this land so that it can sustain, uh, sustain us and future generations. Um, can I share screen? Uh, Ma'am, we can see your presentation. Okay, you can so see my presentation. Okay, so um, this is a district-wide uh, a district-wide initiative, meaning the Rotary District. It, it includes Kingston, um, Montreal, Ottawa, Northern New York, and it looks like it will be adopted by other Rotary Districts, including the Greater uh, Toronto. Now, next slide. Be friendly, no more May is just a start to change mindsets, to appreciate, protect, and enhance biodiversity in our city, and to appreciate the role of biodiversity in mitigating our climate emergency. Now, um, next slide, please. 76% of flying insects has disappeared in the last 27 years. Remember those road trips and needing to clean the windscreen? Well, it's not happening anymore. 
our flying insects and our bumblebees are disappearing very fast. So this biodiversity loss, where did we go wrong? Well, we valued monocultures or grass deserts. Um, we declared native plants as weeds. We, tries to, we try to dominate nature and we cause diseases to be spread through greenhouse fertilizing. We've used poisons and chemical fertilizer and we destroyed lots of land in the name of development, in the name of farming, um, trying to do good, but we have to be careful about this. So um, next slide. I can't see. Oh, a little bit about the history. Uh, marketing to try and sell turf grass, um, weed killers, fertilizers, mowers, weed whackers, trimmers. Uh, over years, advertised lawns emphasizing beauty, family, and communi community values. So over time, perfect lawns became a part of social status. The picture-perfect suburban lawn with a white picket fence, I may say, and with a neatly manicured lawn. Homeowners are proud of the immaculate emerald green wheat free lawns. Um, I am too, or I was too, and at what cost all those hours of trying to get rid of the, of the dandelions. So um, next slide. So I'm asking you, let us get back to basics. Let's work hard um, to learn from nature, to respect her, to respect reciprocate her gift of life to us. And let's give our loans back to nature, or at least start in spring for now, to provide habitat for pollinators. Next slide, please. So pollinators and, and insects sustain not just us, our local human food sources, but also they are food for birds, for reptiles, and so on up the chain. Um, and it also prefers native plants, but Invasive plants and monocultures like lawns uh, threatens life and threatens biodiversity. Next slide. So we often maintain this as well using chemicals that leach into our ecosystems, our homes, our rivers and lakes. It kills biodiversity and I must say uh, lawns use a lot of water. Next slide. Next slide, please. I think we're stuck. Research shows there are environmental, economic, and health benefits from mowing less and by moving away from these lawns and developing naturalized gardens. Next slide. In Trois-Rivières in Canada, a study suggested that costs of 36% may be saved with modest reduction in mowing frequency, so the city can also benefit. And then there's the emissions from fossil fuel mowers, blowers, trimmers, and it's an important source of toxins and carcinogenic exhaust and fine particulate matter. This is an EPA study. So the carbon footprint is huge. So my ask to you, through you, uh, and through you, Chair, and the Council, I'm asking not only to allow lawn owners to participate, but please, can the city take a leadership role by example, in our parks, in our public places, and to do it this year. 30 I think we're running out of time. We cannot be complacent about this, and we need to help to educate citizens. Next, uh, so we, Rotary will provide a lawn sign. This is not the sign, it is something that I put together with some sort of a picture with a uh, Q QR code and logos of participants to uh, for citizens and uh, people to put on their lawns. And in my last 20 seconds, I would okay. also like to, if we can go so, on to dim the... So I'm sorry, I'm sorry, man, we're okay. actually, okay. I'm actually at your time now. But what I will okay. do is um, I'll just open up to the council. Are there any questions for the delegation? Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, thanks so much, Ms. Folkson, for presenting to us today and uh, showing us why a no mo may is so beneficial. I know as part of our motion tonight, it says that the first 1,000 participants can um, contact the Rotary Club and um, get the sign that you just showed on your last slide. Do you want to um, just tell Council you know, in April that we can start promoting it if the motion passes tonight? I would uh, say that they could email, email me at this email address that you have, alcibi at falkson.ca. 
All right, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Foxen. Yeah, with that, we'll move, we'll move to our uh, second delegation. We invite Joyce Hostin to appear before council also to speak to new motion number one with respect to no mo may. Ms. Hostin is there. Do, do we have Ms. Hostin online, Madam Deputy Clerk? We do? Oh, there we Sorry, go. Was I muted? There we go. Uh, Ms. Hostin, welcome, and uh, I will pass the floor over to you. Hi, thank you so much, and sorry about that. I'm Joyce Hostin. Um, I'm here as a master gardener, as a little forester, and to speak for all the non-human creatures. You see at the top the number of creatures, basically none supported by conventional lawns, versus at the bottom the number of creatures supported by biodiverse flowering lawns. Next slide. 2.9 billion birds gone since 1970 alone. We are in a biodiversity crisis. Next slide. It's not just the birds, it's as Elsa B said, the insects as well. 60% of our population of biodiversity is insects. Some um, scientists are calling it an insectopolis. Next slide. Why does that matter? You know, A, maybe we want less insects. No, they're at the foundation of the food chain. And even this chickadee needs 9,000 caterpillars to raise their chicks to maturity. That's why we need biodiversity. Um, but we can do something about it. We can change how we cultivate our lawns and our public spaces. This is just the edge of my lawn, which technically is against the bylaw right now. Next slide, please. This is how youth imagine the future. On the right-hand side are all images from youth imagine the future in Kingston this fall, and on the left in Calgary. They imagine green spaces, green cities filled with trees, vegetable gardens, ponds, and wildflowers. This type of city is the type of city that are bio that was also biodiverse. Next slide, please. So normal may matters, but we need to think beyond normal may as well. Dandelions are actually junk food for pollinators. They only have 15% protein. Pussy willow, a native plant, 40% protein. Next slide, please. So thinking beyond no mome, we need to engage and tend and cultivate natural plant communities like this community of plants that blooms at the same time as those dandelions. This is Golden Alexanders and Columbine. Next slide, please. Doing this, native plants, 50% more native birds, nine times more rare birds, three times more butterfly species, two times more native bees. That's who we will be supporting. Next slide, please. So Master Gardeners have declared this the year of the biodiverse garden. We have a weekly Ask a Master Gardener. We have presentations every week to support the community. Our themes are edible gardens, seasonal gardens, climate resilient gardens, and biodiverse gardens. We have a ton of visitors visit our website and between 60 and 80 people each week join us to learn because they are desperate to do something about the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. Next slide, please. Just an example, next month, one of our webinars is talking about living lawns, biodiverse lawns that instead of grass, a polyculture that we can have that still could occasionally be mowed. Next slide, please. We also don't talk about fall and spring cleanup anymore. Instead, we talk about leaving stems for the stem nesting bees. We talk about leaving the leaves for all of the pollinators and the caterpillars like this beautiful luna moth. Next slide, please. So that we ask the city of Kingston to use their social media like this, this motion is really awesome but to also promote Year of the Biodiverse Garden, to promote, to point people to like the Master Gardeners where they can get support about identifying the name the invasive species and how to steward their lawns, not just stop mowing them. Next slide, please. And we actually are gonna have a pledge for the pledge for biodiversity that we're gonna launch and a garden tour in August to educate people. Next slide, please. 
we ask, oh, actually, previous slide, <laughs> sorry. One of the, and the other thing we ask is that City of Kingston lead by example and to not mow the verges during no mow May and to consider going down to zero to two mowings a year. This doesn't just help support biodiversity, but it becomes the start of a green network that the pollinators can move along the roads. Um, next slide, please. And thank the city council for its motion to permit pollinator gardens, um, well, to review the bylaws to permit pollinator gardens. We actually spoke at the Ontario Association of Property Standards Officers who asked us, they, they said they're getting a lot more bylaw complaints, so they wanted to learn about native plants. And we said, you don't really need to learn about native plants. You need to learn about invasive species because the new bylaws like Toronto's, they don't, they allow everything as because that's what the Charter of Rights supports. And instead, they only ban a certain, like I think it's 11 plants. 30 seconds. Last slide. So that's it, I guess I'm done. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions for the delegation? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Hostin, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to our third and final delegation. We'll invite Nathan Nesdeli, who will appear before council, to speak to new motion number one, again with respect to no mole may. Please, yes, you can please come up to the uh, to the podium here. Let's go. Uh, good evening, Mayor Patterson, councillors, and staff. Thank you for your time and for your efforts to make Kingston a better place for its human and non-human constituents. Uh, my name is Nathan Nesdoli. I'm a retired teacher and a current volunteer with Little Forest Kingston and Rideau Thousand Islands Master Gardeners. I am also a climate action champion for Portsmouth District. So, as such, I'd like to give a shout out to Councillor Amos, who, I will add, has been an incredible supporter of three little forests and the food forest currently in the works at the Senior Centre site. I'm here to support Councillor Tozo's No Mo May initiative as a worthwhile example of a step that we can take as a community to support our biodiversity an opportunity to engage citizens and develop their awareness of the importance of restoring habitat to the numerous living organisms who comprise our urban ecosystem. We are only one species among many. Converting even a fraction of our current lawn area to native plants would extend food and habitat for countless species of bees, other pollinators such as ants, butterflies and moths, and for the birds, reptiles, amphibians and small mammals that in turn feed on them. It would also support the millions of microscopic organisms that live in each handful of soil. The tiny inhabitants that make up our soil food web, the basis of terrestrial life. In my capacity as climate action champion, I'm applying for a grant, a city grant, to transform a 20 square meter plot of underused land into a neighborhood pollinator seed garden. My hope is to plan and plant the garden with community input to develop a stewardship process to care for the land, to harvest the seed in the fall, and then hold workshops in the winter to teach me and my neighbors to successfully grow and care for native plants, which can be tricky. With the understanding that we will plant our seedlings on the land we occupy or gift our seeds to someone else who is able to find them a home. This is an example of a distributed micro-nursery model where many gardeners cooperate to plant, harvest, and share seed. Efforts to establish these grassroots organizations are taking shape in Kingston. For example, two weeks ago, I attended a Zoom call with 10 other people who were learning how to propagate pawpaws. Uh, if you're not aware of what pawpaws are, I suggest to Google, P-A-W, P-A-W. They are a delicious fruit indigenous to Eastern North America. In the last 50 years, our climate has gotten milder so that plants like the pawpaw that historically grew on the other side of Lake Ontario can now grow comfortably here but trees are slow walkers, so they benefit from our help. If we engage our community in actions such as this, people respond, not everyone, but many. If we get plants into the ground, we can build community at the same time that we sequester carbon. I moved into the Woodlands neighborhood just under two years ago. I inherited a somewhat anemic lawn and planting beds that had many non-native and invasive species. Common buckthorn, garlic mustard, mock strawberry, dog strangling vine, gout weed, to name a few, all of which outcompete native trees and plants and do nothing to provide food for native animal species. I gave away many of the non-invasive plants, covered my arable 1,500 square feet with eight inches of wood mulch, 
And now, I am actively converting my front and backyard into a food forest, vegetable garden, and pollinator garden. All species planted are native or edible. Support from the neighbors has been overwhelming. I think because my scheme has been so obviously intentional. For all who care to look, each plant species is labeled. The deep mulch so far makes the front yard look neat. And planting around the fruit trees and bushes still looks controlled. The plants haven't yet had long enough to enter the wild phase, yet. But the wild phase is the magic phase. When I see insects in numbers I haven't seen for years, when I hear birds sing in the middle of the city, when I feel like the land is becoming what it wants to be, I know I'm on the right track. By encouraging Kingston residents to experience some of that intentional wilding, some of that magic, even for a month, is worth the time and effort of this council and our citizens. Thank you again for your time and your attention. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the delegation? Councillor Ostroff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and thank you for your presentation. It, it certainly resonates, as, uh, and, and all three presentations were excellent, so um, I wanted to thank them as well. Uh, the, con the question I have that is, um, how, how can we contact you, or how, as a rural councillor, we, we deal a lot with invasive species, and um, I think that uh, we work, I work closely, actually, with the city on strategic mowing along the ditches and this kind of thing, and uh, so those are, still important important uh, practices to to manage that but um, is there a point that where what you your education potentially are uh, what we can learn to um, because I'm very much an advocate but what could you you tell us or how could we connect with you that we can uh, accomplish things more environmentally friendly in the rural area as well um, the Master Gardeners and the Little Forest Kingston have, um, have uh, websites and there's, there's a lot of inv uh, information in Master Gardeners about planting, not so much about invasive species and I don't know that website well enough to know, Councillor Oosterhoff, whether you'd find specifics on native mm -hmm. species, um, but I agree and all of our members, certainly in Little Forest, but in, in Master Gardeners are very much concerned about invasive species and educating people in getting invasive species off of their property. And for the, for the reasons that I mentioned above. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question or not. I guess I just want to I get that. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. I just want to, I want that, I'll, I will work with you. We can connect connect for the rural area and, and, and working with the city on, on possibilities. I, I can reach out to you specifically. Thank sir. you. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Ames. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Um, I just want to recognize Mr. Uh, Nesvoli's uh, climate action initiatives. He has done a, a fantastic job so far in probably the, well, it is the best district in the, in the city, and that's Portsmouth. Um, and that each of you have your own uh, champions, but I can honestly say I probably have the best, but I'll leave it at that. Um, question. What is, the, what is the best way, I know there's a question there. <laughs> What's the best way that Portsmouth district residents can get a hold of our champion? and set the example for the rest of the city. I'll be putting out an article in the Portsmouth District Community Association and I'll have my email there and my contacts there. So. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you, and thank you for the terrific presentation to all the delegates who spoke on this matter. Uh, also, a great district is Kings Court Rideau. I'm a large fan as well. How can they get in touch with you? Could we get? Could you send me your email information in case there's any uh, correspondence that I can pass through? I'd be happy to be in touch with you personally, uh, Councillor Tozo. Is it Tozo? Tozo. Yeah, tozo. tozo. I, I, I was trained as a singer, so Tozo. 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 You have to use your hand gesticulations to make it really work. Sir, thank you. Okay, so no more questions saying that you're, you have the best district and how do we get a hold of the delegation? Are there any other, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Okay, so we have no further delegations. Um, we have no briefings. One petition uh, listed a petition bearing approximately 74 signatures with respect to the increase in break-ins, property damage, and theft at 350 Wellington Street was delivered to the city's clerk department January 23rd, 2023. Are there any other petitions to present? Okay, seeing none, we will move on. We have two motions of uh, condolence. First moved by Councillor Amos, seconded by Councillor Stephen.
that the sincere condolences of King City Council will be extended to the family and friends of Colleen LaBelle, who passed away January 29th, 2023. With her work at Our Livable Solutions, Martha's Table, and volunteering on the streets, Colleen is remembered as a guardian angel for all people who suffer in poverty and experience homelessness. Colleen provided the small touches and conversations which made big differences in people's lives. Our thoughts are with her family, friends, and the unhoused community during this difficult time. Number two, moved by, Councilor, or moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that the sincere condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to the family and friends of Dr. Hans Westenberg, who passed away on January 23rd, 2023. Hans was born in the Netherlands and later lived in Pittsburgh Township, where he ran successfully for Township Council. He also served as Honorary Council for the Netherlands and Eastern Ontario, and recently was inducted into the Kingston Rowing Hall of Fame. Hans leaves behind his loving wife, Marion, and children. We extend our deepest sympathies to the family and friends of Dr. Westenberg and to all who knew him. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have no deferred motions this evening, so we will move on to reports. First up, we have report number 16 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Shave, seconded by Councillor Boehm, that report number 16 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. Okay, so the first clause is patio application for 377 Princess Street. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Number two, 2023-2026 strategic plan selection of facilitator. Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Um, a question for staff. I know it was a, is a, it was a, um, a scoring system that was determined to reach the final uh, for the recommendation of Strategic Corp. My question is, were they also the lowest bidder? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through Mr. Mayor. So, no, they were not uh, the lowest bidder. The prices range, I would say, from about 30,000 to 100,000 um, from the different proponents. So there was a wide variety. Now, I will say that they are the only ones that have in their proposal indicated that they will uh, reach out to members of council one-on-one -on -one before the session, which I think is really important. And they came forward, obviously, with far more experience than the other uh, proponents. Thank you. Councillor Senek. Thank you, uh, through you, Your Worship. Um, a question to staff. I know that we go through the strategic planning process every four years, and I just wondered, um, is this um, what, we, what we normally pay, like up to 65,000? I, I tried to Google how much we paid in 2018, and I couldn't find it, but I remember it was um, Suzanne Gibson and Associates, I think, was the company that we used in 2018. I just wondered if it's comparable, and if you think that we're going to be spending like closer to the 65 mark, or if it's just loosely up to 65,000. See you, Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through Mr. Mayor. So, in terms of the 2018. I don't believe that that was actually, um, that went out to, um, to any kind of tendering or RFP process. So initially, Suzanne was contracted to do work just with council, but we had to actually add uh, some work to her scope to work with city staff. So I don't have the exact number, uh, Councillor Osanik, but I would say between the the various sessions that we had to engage her in, we probably got in the range of 40 to 50, somewhere in there. Um, so this one is a little bit higher than what we had back in 2018. And like I said, one of the things that they're proposing to do differently is to actually do an outreach and do some one-on-one -on -one with each member of council, which I know wasn't happening in the past. I think this will be a good opportunity for every member of council to provide some input as far as the process is concerned. All right, thank you. Definitely looking forward to talking one-on-one -on -one with uh, this consultant. Thank you. Councillor Glenn. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've been involved in several strategic planning processes with various boards, and so, um, out of curiosity, sort of a two-part question, um, the format is going to be fully public. Is this something that has been done in the past? And if not, 
uh, what prompted the change to having it be a fully public process. Thank you. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, the last uh, strategic plan that took place was actually open to the public. We did have a few members of the public that I think attended uh, most of the sessions. So this would not be a change from what we did last uh, the last time around. Okay, we'll call the vote on Clause 2. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, Clause 3, Leasing of the Kingston Area Recycling Centre Facility. Councillor Shapes. Uh, thank you. Um, could someone explain, please, why we are doing this and why, like, why we're leasing the CARC and why we're not continuing the service? Uh, Mr. Hollett. Thank you for the question. Um, so legislation has been uh, has been passed. Transition for our facility right now is uh, is uh, intended to happen on July first, twenty twenty five. The intent of the model of the legislation is that uh, to move the responsibility for operating the blue box system from the municipalities to the producers and, the, and that the provincial legislation governing that transition does, does not identify a role for municipalities going forward. So uh, go ahead, Adam, if you're ready. Uh, yeah, so uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, some additional context uh, is that the year, we're currently we're spending 50% of the cost of the blue box system from the municipal perspective. Uh, that 50% that is covered by the producers will be going away. So even if we choose to continue operating our recycling system, we're A, not entitled to any of the recyclable material that we can then resell, and then B, we will not be receiving any funding to continue to operate. Thank you. Uh, one further question. Uh, what will be the status of the employees currently working there after this takes effect? Um, yes, Commissioner Joyce. Thank you and through you, Your Worship. So currently, the most of the operation is a contract operation. Uh, we do have some staff uh, that uh, do some you know, uh, overseeing of the operation, maintenance of the operation. The effect on our city employees, our union employees, uh, will affect approximately four employees. We expect that two positions will become redundant, and our intention is to uh, assimilate those positions into our public works portfolio over the next few years, which we don't expect to be very difficult to do. Thank you very much. Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Um, Councillor Shaves pretty much asked my question. My concern was about employee retention through the uh, transfer of Kirk to the another operator. Um, I was reading the equipment that Kingston has put into Kirk over the last couple of years is non, we can't sell it. We, we, um, is there any, any use that we can have for it or is it just automatically get transferred to the uh, new group that takes it? Commissioner Joyce. So it's very specialized equipment, obviously, processing equipment. Uh, so the market is relatively narrow for the equipment. The cost to remove that equipment uh, would be a significant factor in the uh, revenue stream. And when we looked at it, when the consultant looked at the options, the better option is to provide the facility as a, as a functioning facility for lease and sell the equipment to that operator outright. Thank you. Okay, we will call the vote. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Stephen, go ahead. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so if I'm understanding this correctly, it sounds like this change in legislation is going to result in a financial loss in terms of the city, is that correct? Big picture. 
Commissioner Joyce. So we currently receive about $2 million in direct funding from um, the province to operate the facility. That would disappear completely. And as um, the staff indicated, we would also lose the revenue stream on the sale of the materials as well. So it would be a significant impact. Um, follow up, so is it then, it is staff's opinion um, that the leasing of the property and the selling of the equipment there is the best way to mitigate this loss? Thank you, and through your, uh, your worship, that is correct. We believe this to be the best solution overall uh, for the municipality. Thank you. And I noticed uh, there were three options given. So there was sell, there was uh, lease, and then also uh, lease it as an industrial site, and then there was lease it and sell the machinery. Um, understanding that right now the work is contracted out, correct? Uh, so in that case, has anyone explored or has it been an option in the past of having it as a city run or is that just completely not feasible? Commissioner Joyce. Thank you and through you. The feasibility um, would certainly be in question. We do not believe that there would be a real opportunity for the city to, to bid. The intention is very clear from the province to move this over to a circular uh, economy. And um, there's no question that it will be a very competitive market focused a lot on the financial stream. The city is probably not in the best position to be able to be in that competitive market. So then in that case, is it basically businesses making more money is kind of where this is coming full circle? So I would say that the intention of the province, of course, is to bring it around that it's the individual producer's responsibility for the, the waste that they're generating, that they have to deal with that waste. The mechanisms that are in place and the framework that the, the province is putting in through legislation is to enable that. The municipalities are not in a good position to be able to be in that market. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so we will call the vote on clause, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Chenani, go ahead. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wondered, um, currently as it is right now operating um, with the financial two million from the province, were we running this in a cash flow positive or was it neutral or were we losing money uh, with this operation? Thank you, and through your worship. So, Councillor, the taxpayer was paying for this. It was uh, subsidized by the province to, to the tune of two million. We get some revenue from the recyclable materials, uh, but there was still a cost, yes. So the follow up, if we change and we don't run it anymore, then it's no longer the taxpayer's cost? Through you, your worship, that's correct. Councillor Sun. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, through you, your worship. Um, so what is the ultimate benefit to giving this facility to lease, and what is the, um, what kind of loss we're going, going to have um, if we give, give away the, the, this facility? Commissioner Joyce. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So, Councillor, the ultimate benefit of this is that we're maximizing the asset that we have. If we don't take advantage of this, we risk having a stranded asset that we will lose money on. So in order to, to capitalize on the opportunity, this is the best uh, mechanism to do that. The best strategy going forward is to, is to take advantage of this and hopefully that we can find an entity, and we have had interest, I can tell you, in, in the property to run it as such. So we are hopeful that we will be successful in obtaining a lease that 
will take that and buy the equipment and provide that revenue stream into the city. And a follow-up question, is that going to affect the uh, service to the residents? So I, I can I let my staff maybe jump in after this, but the legislation is pretty clear that uh, they are to meet the existing levels uh, that are provided uh, by the municipality. Uh, Mr. Halder, Mr. Mueller, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Okay. Yeah, I can add a couple things that you did. Uh, that level of service is maintained until 2026, uh, at which point the Ontario as a whole will transfer over to what's considered a standard recycling program. So all municipalities will have the same recyclable materials that are going to be accepted curbside and with most likely an identical collection system as well. It might be different than we currently have. It may be better. Um, but the idea behind it is that everybody will get the exact same service level. Okay, we'll call the vote. Uh, Councillor Tozo. Sorry, thank you. very brief question. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. So is this an example of a provincial government uploading a municipal responsibility, if I'm understanding this correctly? Commissioner Joyce? <laughs> <laughs> My apologies, Your Worship. Um, somewhat, yes, I would say so. I think what they're, they're not, I wouldn't necessarily say it's an upload as a transfer over to another entity being the producers. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll call the vote then on Clause 3. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moving on to report number 17 from Planning Committee. Moved by Councillor Osterhoff, seconded by Councillor Shaves, that report number 17 from the Planning Committee be received and adopted. Uh, there's just the one clause, approval of zoning bylaw plan amendment 16 North Bartlett Street. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, on to report number 18 from Heritage Kingston. Moved by Councillor Osterhoff, seconded by Councillor Glenn, that report number 18 from Heritage Kingston be received and adopted. Uh, would anyone like any of the clauses separated? Uh, if not, we will vote on uh, report 18 as a whole. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have nothing from Committee of the Whole. Information reports, just raise your hands if you have any questions. Number one, 2020 and 2021 community greenhouse gas emission inventories and update on community-focused climate initiatives. Number two, yeah, Councillor Shaves, go ahead. Um, in regards to this report, I noticed that there was a consultant. I'm just wondering why we hire a consultant and how much was that cost? Uh, Ms. Salter Keen. Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we do hire a consultant. We don't have the technical expertise on staff. We provide the, uh, our consultant with the, the data from our different sources and work with him, and he provides the reports to us. Um, we've been outsourcing this work probably since 2011, and this report costs uh, $5,000. Um, thank you. So there's no way we would have someone that's both technically capable of doing this study or economically feasible to do it, correct? Uh, thank you, and to you, Mr. Mayor, absolutely. Uh, we need the technical expertise from uh, Mr. Mannion, who's on the call tonight. Thank you. Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Uh, the Better Homes Kingston program, has the funding maxed out for that program? Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have the, the funding is a four-year funded program. Uh, we had stalled the application intake, but we certainly have the projects that we need to work through um, over the next four years. So we have not stalled our, the work with respect to the intake of money, but we will be looking in the long term to how we can sustain the program after the funding does uh, cease. Do we have, uh, from my, I'm trying to recall the training sessions that we've had. 
do we have a retrofit program that helps our residents lower their emissions? And I want to say we do, and it, that program is maxed out. Is there a way to is there a way to reopen that program so that more residents can uh, tap into that? Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So it is the Better Homes Kingston program. That is the retrofit program for residential dwellings. And um, the funded program is for 500 applications. We have approximately 470 applications intaked right now, but that will take four years to complete the entire program itself for the funded program. Uh, as I just mentioned, we will be looking at bringing an additional report to Council uh, later this year of options, how we can look at uh, continuing the program with uh, third-party lending, for example, and other sources of funding that may be available through uh, different provincial and federal programs. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stephen. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in the report, it talks about scope three emissions, and I was just wondering, uh, Ms. Silterkeen, if you could please explain just briefly what that means and why it might be important. I, I realize it's not in this report, but it, it sounds like it's a goal for future reports. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, I would like to introduce uh, Nathan Mannion, who is our consultant uh, here this evening to respond to that question. Thank you. Mr. Mannion. Hi, uh, thank you and through you, uh, your mayor. Um, so scope three emissions, um, what these scopes are basically talking about are different system boundaries of where these emissions come from. So scope one and scope two, those are the types of emissions that we're talking about usually in these reports, which are things that are directly from the city. Scope three emissions are usually the things that result from activities um, from assets that maybe aren't controlled or maybe aren't owned by, by, by the city or the community. Um, but you're maybe, uh, you know, sort of indirectly affect, uh, affected by it in the, in the supply chain, the value chain. So one of those areas that's sort of really easy to think about is transportation. So you may buy purchase gas in Kingston, which we account for in the inventory, but you may go and drive and, and burn those emissions elsewhere inside the city. And, and conversely, someone might buy some gas somewhere else and come in and, and burn those emissions inside the city. So those are examples of, of scope three where you're in, involved in the supply chain, but you're not necessarily directly involved in it um, and so transportation is one of the easier ones to start with uh, and so that's where we're going to start uh, with the city try and flush those out there's obviously other things that that we can then tease out um, but the the sort of aim of the inventories here is to sort of work with the things that are the biggest emissions first and then start to fine tune and, and make sure we're getting things as accurate as possible thank you that sounds challenging to measure um, one other question I have, uh, in the report it talks about uh, various initiatives that are going on in a progress update. Uh, managed forests and tree canopy initiatives, uh, three large city properties have been identified for managed forest plantation and I was wondering what these properties are, if we could be told please. Um, there's a, a memo that I'm putting together for the city. Uh, it should be put together probably within the next week or two that outlines sort of what sort of strategies could go on those sites, uh, how they could maximize carbon sequestration, how they could be uh, uh, incorporated into a, a larger sustainability, sustainability plan. Um, so you, you can, I can share those details with you uh, probably within the next week or so. Uh, Commissioner Gubas. Uh, thank you and through you and, and thank you, Nathan. So. I'll do them one better. There will be a report coming to EITP. I believe it's Valentine's Day, February 14th. That's how I remembered. So there's a there's a report update on the Managed Forest Program for, for Council and Committee uh, then, which is a week from now. You know how to win a girl's heart. Thanks. <laughs> That's a good line. Uh, Councillor Tozo. Th thank you, Your Worship. Sorry. That was, that was great, Councillor Stephen. Um, 
Jeez, what was my question? Um, okay, thank you, Worship through you. I'll start again. Um, thank you very much for the report. I want to, one of the largest polluting sectors that I saw in the report was the ICI sector. Can you talk about the relationship the city has with our industrial and commercial partners and getting them on board and their the collaborative role that we have, if we have one, uh, in meeting our climate change targets? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Soldier King. Thank you. I will pass this uh, over to Nathan Mannion for a response. Wait, Mr. Mannion. Uh, thank, thank you and through you, uh, Your Honor. Um, for ICI, uh, one of the challenges we have in the inventory is the sort of resolution that we get the data from. So we don't necessarily have information on uh, individual uh consumers per se you know we sort of have things at postal code level uh that's where i get the data from um uh there are some large emitters um what i can say is that from the work that i've done on um sustainable low carbon industrial parks and sustainable low carbon uh business parks there's lots of examples of those uh in europe and elsewhere that have started to pop up uh, one of the key things uh, among all of them that has made them successful has been uh, having a grassroots discussion first. So you have to have those discussions with the groups, uh, you know, get them to a table. Uh, everyone, you know, works together as, as a community to find solutions. And then you can start to do things like, you know, find a company that has, uh, you know, waste that another company can use as a resource and you can find it, to, you know, find solutions that way. Um, so I think anything where you're going to start to approach those ICIs should look to those sort of uh, positive uh, examples elsewhere. Uh, and it, that really starts with just, you know, sitting down and having a conversation uh, with those with those large emitters just on, a, you know, a, a very holistic basis. Okay, seeing no other questions. Oh, Councillor Ostroff, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that, Mayor, Mayor Passion. Thank you. Just a question. Will this, Ms. Salter-Keen, will this be presented to Rural Advisory? Or does it go further from here? Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. No, these reports come directly to Council. Yeah, I meant a follow-up or not to, does it, like I see the tree planting on here, and I'm just curious, will rural advisory know if that's also in the, is this just in the urban area, urban boundary? Commissioner Hugabas? Yeah, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So the, the managed, managed forest came out of um, previous direction with Council and we did commit to coming back to EITP yeah. at that time, uh, but we can we can do that, and we can we can definitely bring that information to the rural advisory as well after after the EITP meeting next week. Okay, that be, that'll be appreciated. Yeah, yeah no problem. Okay, uh, so moving on, number two, report on real estate transactions completed from July first, twenty twenty two, to December thirty first, twenty twenty two, under bylaw number twenty sixteen one eight nine. Number three, quarterly report, Tourism Kingston, Q4 2022. Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Um, I noticed in October that uh, Tourism Kingston, or somebody in Tourism, I believe Tourism Kingston, uh, hosted a sport town hall. Um, there was no indication of what did the groups indicate or what did they come up with. Uh, Ms. Knott. Yes, uh, through you, Mayor uh, Patterson, and thanks for the question, Councillor. So we do two uh, sport town halls essentially a year, and we started this in, back in 2020. So the reason that we started these sport town halls is directly to communicate to local sport organizations. There are 120 local sport organizations that we com uh, communicate with often within the city, and those span from every different kind of sport you could think of, traditional and non. Um, essentially, what we did was we knew that local sport organizations were probably going to be hit the hardest rather than provincial or national uh, local, uh, local sport organizations. Obviously, we're hindered by the fact that participants couldn't pay registration fees, and that's where they draw most, if not all, of their income from, as well as sponsorship opportunities when they're not accessing or obviously delivering on the event itself, that they would be, you know, highly... Uh, at risk of closing. Um, and so where we jumped in was we had these sport town halls to communicate and clarify how we could help these organizations. And so 
what we've taken away from that is that local sport organizations enjoy these um, meetings. And so actually uh, tomorrow evening, if anyone wants to attend, our next one is happening at the Invista Center at 6 p.m. So all, all welcome. Um, and essentially uh, what we take away are things like uh, venue needs, um, access to grants, and we walk through what grant funding opportunities may uh, help our local sport organizations. We talk about what um, type of barriers uh, with accessibility or other um, opportunities where we can jump in and help. And then the feedback's brought forward to the next sport town hall. So if you want to talk offline about the exact sort of transcription of what happened, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. I think um, that's, it, this is great to know. I mean, a, a lot of our um, local sports groups are, are grassroots level groups. And it's nice to see that there's an entity that is trying to organize and support them. So that's a, a fantastic way for our, our local uh, children, young adult, older adult uh, activities to keep the momentum going for uh, active engagement. I also noticed um, in the report, there was a number of pictures um, that included the Fort Henry Guard and Fort Henry, but I didn't see any report or any, any uh, inclusion of the St. Lawrence Park Commission and uh, some sort of report with Tourism Kingston and the St. Lawrence Parks Commission. And I know I talked about this at the last uh, training session, but is it, did, was there an activity that took place in this, in this report or this quarter that just didn't get in it, or did I miss it? No, so from the perspective of the St. Lawrence Parks Commission in the Q4, um, uh, to, in the Q4 report, essentially things that we would have touched touched on or talked about were, would have been travel trade opportunities. So Pumpkin Furna would have been the largest event that happened at Fort Henry specifically in the fall. That's a main driver of our fall campaign, to be quite honest. So it's obviously a family friendly event that um, we actually had a lot um, of conversation with St. Lawrence Parks Commission in terms of bringing that event to our region because essentially it was very successful and still is in um, their other part of the operation, Upper Canada Village. And so we didn't want to dilute the participation of that particular event, but we definitely wanted to do something other than uh, the traditional event which happened, which was Fort Fright, which was a bit more niche in nature. So we definitely work with them in that particular quarter on that event. And, and in, in addition, obviously they run um, the Kingston Penitentiary tours. And so we work with them quite closely on ensuring that film can um, work within the vicinity of KP alongside um, those tours. And so those tours didn't wrap up until November. So we would um, we would have still had partnerships through SLPC and TK on working on those components. And then anything to do with our sales, whether travel trade business events or otherwise, we're always working in partnership, uh, especially in their travel trade uh, portfolio. Amber uh, Jamison, who we work with quite closely, um, is ensuring that we're getting rates in time because our uh, sales group actually goes out as of Jan 1st and talks about the things that you can do um, at Fort Henry KP or other in 2023 um, as we start the new year and a new sales cycle. So um, if they're not highlighted in the report specifically, it's just assumed that we work with them quite closely, to be honest. Thank you. They're uh, obviously a big com component of tourism for our city, so it's nice to see a collaboration. Thank you. Councillor Shapes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the report. Uh, it was very informative. I noticed there was a, uh, a portion in there spoke to a study that pooled all the community sports, uh, tourism assets, gaps, and what could be done to close those gaps. So I just wondering what those gaps were and the recommendations to close them. Uh, great question. Thanks for that, Councillor, and uh, through you, Mayor um, Patterson. So. Um, what we've done in the sport tourism portfolio is we've looked at the Rec and Leisure Master Plan. That was our first um, deliverable. Second to that, we looked at our integrated destination strategy. And third to that, we looked at the impact COVID's had on our local sport organizations. And out of that, we realized that there needs to be a long-term plan for venues. So we look at venues in, in particular ways uh, as it relates to the sport lens. So we look at venues that are privately owned. We look at the venues that are publicly owned and we look at hybrids um, in between both. And so 
We want to ensure that local, national, provincial, and the mix of all three work collaboratively with one another so that we can host all of these types of events, ensuring that our residents have you know, equal access as do our visitors when it relates to sport and then shoring up those gaps. So what's happening this week in particular is a portion of that study which continues to happen. So Grant McDonald from the Canadian Sport uh, Tourism Association is actually in Kingston this week. We've sent out a survey to local stakeholders ensuring that any uh, venue gaps that stakeholders are feeling we're, we're aware of. We're doing in-person stakeholder consultations so that board members, um, uh, sport tourism partners, uh, et cetera, as well as city partners, and ensuring that we bring all that feedback um, back into a report that suggests or outlines or highlights any gaps that we see in our sport infrastructure specifically, and then trying to look at the best uh, path forward to see if we can shore up those gaps. So right now, it's essentially that the study is happening. It's in progress this week and that we'll bring back um, a report in early March to see where our next steps will be. Okay, thank you, I look forward to that. Uh, okay, uh, moving on, number four, rural commuter transit study for Kingston and neighboring municipalities. Uh, Councillor Ostroff. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and um, I really appreciate this report. Um, and I just, I was at the meeting with them uh, recently and um, really found the energy at that meeting really powerful and uh, excited. I was really pleased with the, um, the cooperation and the involvement of, uh, of neighboring communities. There was a, a real sense of um, um, involvement together and, and uh, equal, uh, equal uh, opportunity for benefiting from this. And so the question I have is related to what 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 follows up with this study? Like uh, for I think uh, Councillor Baum, uh, maybe he was there too, or another councillor was there. But uh, we were there. We we see the potential of something happening, and how, how do we how do we get beyond this? And uh, I certainly want to thank you know the city for doing this and looking at it as seriously and including so, so many stakeholders. It's very well done, and um, I just wonder what's next, Mr. Bromberg or or CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll um, get started, and um, uh, my colleague might want to jump in to add some details. So the, the study is not yet complete. Um, Councillor Usaroff, we're still in the process of gathering information. Um, we're identifying, obviously, what options could be, but one of the, I think, very important component of this will be the cost related <laughs> to any kind of service. So um, we're still in that... Uh, phase of gathering information and pulling that together. Uh, this will come back obviously to, uh, to council, but will also go to our surrounding uh, partners. And once we have that information, then I, I think council will be a, in a better position to decide why, what might come next and how that might be structured. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Councillor Sinek. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, um, like the town of Westbrook, it doesn't have any transit either, but I know that this study, it says for Kingston and neighboring municipalities, Westbrook's within Kingston. Can Westbrook be part of this study as well? Like I know we're looking at going in Amherst View as far as the Loyalist Family Health Team and to Genanoque to the east and to the north to South Frontenac but Westbrook as well doesn't have any uh, transit. So my question to staff is if um, that would be part of the study or how does Westbrook fit into future transit plans? CEO Hurdle. Thank you and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So this study was actually based on the, um, the council strategic priority and one in particular that looked at the rural uh, transportation. So Westbrook is within the urban boundary. We didn't include it because honestly, Westbrook eventually, and I'll let Commissioner Joyce comment on that, but eventually should be serviced in some way by Kingston Transit. The rural um, aspect or component of uh, Kingston, to be quite frank, it is quite unlikely that we would bring the regular Kingston Transit service out to the rural area. We would be looking at 
different ways to service it that wouldn't be as costly. Um, so I think that's why they're, they're separated and they're different. And I'm not sure if Commissioner Joyce would like to add to that. Sure, and thank you. Uh, through you, Your Worship. So we expanded uh, service, as you know, into the Woodhaven uh, subdivision uh, just late this past year. The, we currently are continuing to, to rebuild our transit service to pre-COVID levels. But what I would say is that the future expansion of Kingston Transit the direction that we take is a strategic direction that's going to be driven by discussions at council and by council uh, when we come to our strategic sessions in March. Because there's different ways Kingston Transit can be expanded, of course, right? There's enhancement of, of existing services, so meaning it's more frequent services, but same service, it's expansion into more local areas, it's expansion of express routes. So there's there's many options. This council will have to decide where that priority lies to an extent, and then we'll take our, um, our direction from council and, and come back with plans to try to meet what council is trying to achieve with that. Uh, Councillor Stephen. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Shapes. Thank you, Councillor Osanek. Um, she took away one of my questions, but I'm still going to uh, for further on that. One of the um, main topics which I heard of during the summer while I was knocking on doors, especially in Wood, uh, Westbrook, was the matter of lack of public transportation, and they did have it many years ago. And when hearing about this study, I was concerned that I'd be hearing about this again, which it has started up again. Uh, concerns in regards to uh, when bus service would be coming, why are we not getting it, and the role will begin first. So, will this be expanded into Westbrook? Will it be? Will there be a route in Westbrook? Okay. So, uh, so I'm just going to cause that this. I think staff gave the answer that that Westbrook wasn't included in this study. So I am asking for questions related to this particular information report. I'm not sure if there's anything else that staff want to add that hasn't already been said. Okay, one further question, which is different. Um, how much did the study cost and where did the money come from? Mr. Bumberg. Yes, good evening. Thank you for the question and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the study is, uh, the total cost of the study is $48,930, excluding taxes, and it is in, entirely funded by a uh, federal funding grant from Infrastructure Canada in the amount of $50,000. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, we'll, uh, we'll continue on. Uh, we have no information reports from members of council. Miscellaneous business. We have a number of motions. First moved by Councillor Sanek, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff. That is requested by Courtney Murphy, August 7th to the 11th, 2023, to be proclaimed as the 75th anniversary of Angwanad in the city of Kingston. Number two, moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Bohm. That is requested by Stephanie Tudor, Girl Guides of Canada, City Council proclaimed February 22nd, 2023, as World Thinking Day in the city of Kingston. Number three, moved by Councillor Shave, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that Brianne Franklin be affirmed as a community-based arts group representative on the Arts Advisory Committee, appointed for a two-year term ending on November 30th, 2024. Number four, moved by Deputy Mayor Chinani, seconded by Councillor Glenn, that is requested by Margaret O'Brien, Fibromyalgia Association Canada. City Council proclaimed May 12th, 2023 as Fibromyalgia Awareness Day in the city of Kingston. Number five, moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Tozo, that the resignation of Kirsten Bland from the Equity, Diverse, Diversity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee be received with regret, and that in accordance with Section 3.3.2D of the Public Appointment Policy, Elliot Sheppel be appointed from the reserve pool to the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee for a term ending November 30th, 2023. Number six, moved by Councillor Hassan, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that is requested by Alia Strachan, Museum Assistant, City of Kingston. Council designate the event Beer and Bacteria scheduled for Saturday, March 11th, 2023, 
at the Pump House Museum at 23 Ontario Street, Kingston as an event of municipal significance to which a special occasion permit may be issued by the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario. Number seven, moved by Councillor Amos, seconded by Councillor Tozo, that the resignation of Lisa Oliveria from the Kingston and Frontenac Housing Corporation Board be received with regret, and that in accordance with section 3.3.2D of the public appointment policy, Denise Cumming be appointed from the reserve pool to the Kingston and Frontenac Housing Board for term ending November 30th, 2023. We will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moving on to new motions. We have two new motions this evening. Number one, moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Stephen. Whereas insects, especially bees, serve a significant role as pollinators of plants, including agricultural plants, whereas the pollinator bee population is in decline, whereas the ideal pollinator-friendly habitat is one comprised of mostly native wildflowers, grasses, vines, shrubs, and trees, blooming in succession throughout the growing season. Whereas the foundational period for establishing pollinator and other insect species and urban wildlife species that depend on them occurs in late spring and early summer. Whereas Kingston City Council declared a climate emergency on March 5th, 2019. Whereas on December 20th, 2022, Kingston City Council passed a motion permitting pollinator gardens on private properties. Whereas No Mow May is an initiative that encouraged residents to limit lawn mowing practices during the month of May to provide early season foraging resources for pollinators that emerge in the spring. Whereas the Kingston Frontenac Rotary Club KFRC has offered to provide lawn signage to the first 1,000 participants who contact KFRC that wish to participate in the No Mow May initiative. Therefore, be it resolved, the City of Kingston encourage residents to increase pollinator-friendly habitats by promoting pollinator-friendly lawn care practices on their properties from May 1st, 2023 to May 31st, 2023. And the Council directs staff not to enforce Section 4.42.3 of Bylaw Number 2005-100 a bylaw for prescribing standards for the maintenance and occupancy of property within the City of Kingston as amended from May 1st, 2023 to May 31st, 2023 and the month of May during this council term. And the City of Kingston used social media and other platforms to be one of the leaders to actively promote and educate the community about No Mow May and its benefits for generating crucial pollinator supporting habitats. And the council recognized and expressed its appreciation to the Kingston Frontenac Rotary Club for its support during this initiative. Councillor Tozo, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, for one, I would like to thank the Rotary Club of Kingston, all the Rotary Clubs for bringing this to my attention shortly after I was elected. Uh, the beauty of No Mo May in this motion is that it captures one of my many passions, the passion to fight climate change, the passion of helping nature, the passion of collaborating with the community, the passion of voluntary action from members of our community, the passion of social organizations pitching in, the passion of helping pollinators, the passion of helping our bee population, the passion of ensuring the future for our children, and the passion of avoiding yard work. Thank you. But in all seriousness, for a motion that actually asked people to do not very much, there was a tremendous amount of work that was put into this motion. Uh, there was a lot of work by the clerks for helping craft this motion, so I'd like to thank the clerks uh, a great deal and staff for their help in this. I'd like to thank the Rotary Club for uh, uh, providing a thousand signs for people who volunteered to do this motion. Uh, I'd like to thank Councillor Bowman in a roundabout kind of way for his pollinator motion prior in December. Um, I'd like to thank Councillor McLaren who is here, who worked with public health to ensure that this, there was no public health violations here. Um, and I'd like to just uh, thank Curtis Smith especially who works in bylaw for giving me some information further upon this. Um, Einstein once said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that when the bees go, human beings have four years left. That is not something that I would like to see. One third of all of the food that we eat is affected by pollinators. Uh, uh, and we need to encourage that and we need to ensure that we have a future for our kids and a future food supply as well. Uh, one thing I love about this motion is it's voluntary. This is not required. People can voluntarily choose to mow part or not, none of their lawns. Um, it has a scientific basis, which we've heard from the delegates here. Uh, and I'm hoping that this is a start of something great that Kingston can do and we can amplify this year and year, starting with private property lawns and then seeing if we can extend it out to uh, parks with the municipality. Um, that is something I think that we can investigate later on. Um, but we often ask ourselves with this great climate crisis that we've declared of what we can do. Well, what we can do, frankly, is nothing. We cannot mow our lawns. 
Uh, so this has been forwarded by many communities here. It's very popular in the United, United Kingdom. It's been uh, done in Brampton, Cornwall, and Perth County, as well as Fredericton. It helps us fight climate change by little by little efforts. Of course, this is one part of the puzzle. We need the federal government, provincial government to do more work on, on fighting climate change. But no mo, may, no mo may is our way to pitch in, and I would encourage everybody to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councilor Senek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I do support this motion. Um, I've read some books on the huge drop in our insect population, our bird population, like the delegations uh, made us aware tonight. It's uh, devastating when you actually see how the numbers have declined. Um, uh, what I like about this too is that it's voluntary because I do know that there are lots of people in Kingston that really do truly, um, you know, like their lawn and appreciate their lawn. And, you know, who, like, when, if there's the fresh cut lawn and, you know, after having a, a winter of such gray weather and then you get those really nice spring days and someone just cuts the lawn, you know, it really does look nice and green and beautiful and the scent of freshly cut grass. But we're just asking for the month of May not to cut and you can cut in June. And and uh, this is strictly voluntary, so like we're all on the same page. For anyone at home listening to this, uh, you know, it's just if you want to try this. But um, at the same time, I think um, the city, you know, um, if we get lots of people participating, the city will then, you know, come on board, you know, to kind of be like the champion of this. And so I just want to throw an amendment onto the floor uh, just to give um, the city staff some direction and uh, that's um, just to in uh, come back to EITP committee um, in 2024 with um, a list of what um, municipally owned lands um, can you know not be cut then in May 2024 not this May because it's not a lot of time but in May 2024 what lands just for the month of May can staff propose not be cut to support this plan Okay, uh, thank you. Next is Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you, am I talking about the proposal, the, are we going down into that rabbit hole, or are we staying at Councillor Tozo's? Oh yeah, uh, uh, I just proposed a motion, um, an amendment. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I missed, I missed that, Councillor okay, Senate. No I apologize, <laughs> so, so sorry, I'm gonna circle back to you. Uh, can I just see that, can I just see that up on the screen, please? Sorry, Councillor Sanek, yeah, I missed no I missed that you that that piece. Can I just see it on my screen? Okay, so a motion to amend moved by Councillor Sanek, seconded by Councillor Tozo, uh, that new motion number one be amended by adding the following clause there too, that staff be directed to report back to the Environment, Infrastructure, and Transportation Policies Committee by the end of Q1 2024 as to which municipally owned lands the city could leave unmowed during the month of May, 2024. So Councillor Senek, you've already sort of spoken to it. If there's anything else you wanted to say. Okay, so there is the motion to amend on the floor. Does anybody want to speak to that motion to amend? Okay, so we will call the vote. Uh, all those in favor, opposed, uh, and that carries. Councillor Senek, was there anything else that you wanted to address? Okay, great, thank you. So now we'll move to Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Uh, just a quick note, I, I, I wanted to point out, uh, one, a big thanks to the, the three delegates that were here today, especially the Portsmouth District Climate Action Champion, who uh, did a fantastic job pointing out all the wonderful things that Nomo Maid could possibly bring for our community. And uh, I also did not know about Nomo, Mend uh, Nomo May until last year when my stepdaughter in St. Thomas uh, Miranda Scott did this and I didn't understand uh, then but I obviously do now and uh, so there are other uh, cities out there that are leading this cause doing this and it's great that the city of Kingston is now moving forward with this and uh, well done Councillor Tosa. Okay next is Councillor Sun. 
Thank you, Your Worship, uh, through you. Uh, first, I want to thank you, uh, Councillor Tozo, bringing this very passionate and emotional um, uh, piece of motions to, to the council. Uh, I'd li like to support this one, and uh, while I'm supporting this one, I'd like to encourage all the residents in Kingston. Um, as I heard that it's a volunteer, it's uh, no obligation to it, but if everyone can leave some part of their uh, front lawn or the backyard even, to not move, I think that would be very helpful. And it's, it's a good for our nature, and uh, as uh, Councillor Tozo mentioned that, it's good for our uh, children, and it's, it's a very, 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 very much needed. I don't have a whole full information about it, but I'm gonna go back and read some more, and uh, I'm assuming this is a very good one, and then I'd like to support that. Thank you, Councillor Ostroff. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mayor Patterson. I, I do want to thank the mover and the seconder for this too. And uh, certainly I always want to give a little, little bit of a rural perspective on this as well, where much of this actually occurs in the rural area. So on a Sunday afternoon, if you go for a drive on my 300 kilometers of roads, you'll see a, a lot of it. I mean, rural areas often undervalued for so many uh, reasons, I suppose, that we don't go there and see it. But this happens in, in so many ways in, 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 the, in, the, in the, the, the lands that you see that are not necessarily farmland. So I, I celebrate it because I live it, our street lives it in so many ways where we, we, we see that happening. So I wanna say that we join you in that, though I'm not sure because mowing and weeds and all that plays a big role in our, our management of, of our properties and that. So, but I, I wanna say, I, I will support this because I think it's important to support it. It's, a, it's the mindset already is, uh, it's a more of an, it's important to, for the urban area as well to really uh, get on board this. And, and I'm, I appreciate that it's volunteer. So I just wanna make sure we understood uh, the rural perspective and is actively engaged in this and, and we can always do better. Question quickly, is are our schools invited to do this? All the, all the properties in our schools, is that something we have reached into? Councillor Toza? Thank, thank you, Councillor Oosterhoff, for the comment. I did not engage the schools and the school boards. It is worth noting that this is the first year. I'm a fan of incremental good things and I think what this is doing is starting it on private property and I can envision it perhaps next year having municipal property and engaging the schools in the next year. Sure. Um, I think let's see how this goes first and then we can work with Rotary Club and other partners. It's our first time for it and we'll learn from our first experience and hopefully uh, amplify this, but that's a great idea. Yeah, no schools. I understand that our rural schools have some of this where they, they practice the butterfly um, uh, zones and that, and it's very positive, and I would encourage that to happen. Yeah, and I'd be happy to champion Thank that you. as yeah. we go forward. If I could be the environmental counselor, I would be happy to wear that badge. Okay, next is Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. So uh, this may come as a bit of surprise, but uh, this definitely dovetails nicely with the pollinator motion. Um, so I, I cannot in good conscience support this uh, motion without thanking the mover and the seconder for uh, bringing this forward. It definitely uh, really goes a long way towards showing people the small differences that we can make every day. And I truly believe that no single government on its own is going to solve these problems. It's gonna be the individual at the personable level of what we do in our everyday decision making. So literally what this motion is asking people to do is, you know what, take May off, sit back, watch your lawn grow, enjoy the birds and the bees. And one of the, the greatest things about these motions is raising awareness about the, uh, the effect that our pollinators actually have on our food supply. And we know that food scarcity is becoming an ever burgeoning issue uh, within almost all of our society. And many in Canada don't feel that yet uh, because we do have an abundance of food, but that could change quite quickly. Um, so small motions like this actually have big effects. And uh, these are the simple things that we can each do in our day-to-day -day lives. I think that, uh, you know, it reminds me of a meme that I see where years ago people used to see bees and they ran away and they were like, ah, no, a bunch of bees. And, and now they're like, oh, hey there, little buddy. What can I get you? You want some water? Want a little bit of sugar? What do you need? And it's just showing a, a complete change in our perception of uh, how pollinators affect our day to day. And uh, I think that that education is, is very meaningful and it's, it's not only meaningful, it's required. And uh, 
part of what our job is to do is to is to give the next generations the tools to show them how to how to have a sustainable planet and uh, this is one simple thing that you know we all probably did without thinking cut the grass it's what we've always done for years and, and now it's basically like you know what don't cut the grass in may so great motion um sorry to scare you there councillor tozo but uh, uh kudos to you and uh, councillor Stephen for moving this and uh, love to see more little things like this again there's no real cost to uh, to anybody it's it's actually asking you not to do something so don't expend that energy sit back and relax in may and uh, enjoy the birds and the bees cheers Okay, Councillor Shapes. Actually, I'm not going to follow up behind Councillor Boehm, so I'm going to retract my hand. Thank you. Councillor Glenn. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. First, thank you very much for bringing forward this motion. Uh, not only is it a positive one in terms of the environment, but uh, Obviously, you can see the smiles around this council table. Um, I'm also going to thank you for bringing forward the motion. This is like a birthday present for me. I'm born in May, so I'm going to get to take the month off and relax. Um, but on the more serious note, I'm completely in support of this. Uh, I have grown gardens for as long as I can remember. The first job I ever had was gardening, and um, I've seen firsthand the decline in the pollinator populations. So I think this is absolutely um, a an extraordinarily positive move to encourage others to give consideration for those populations. Uh, if you like good food, if you like flowers, um, we need those pollinators. So thank you, and you've got my support. Deputy Mayor Chinini. And through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Tozo, for this uh, motion. Um, yeah, I have this last summer, I uh, experienced a low yield in my peppers. So, and I think it was probably due to the low yield and pollinators. So I'm hoping that with this motion and people going through this, that next year will be more, uh, have a bigger bounty. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Cancer Tozer, you have the last word. Is there anything else you want to say? Uh, I just very briefly, uh, thank you very much for the support of council. I really appreciate this. Um, I think that this will learn a lot from the first mo Nomo May. I'd like to see it enhanced year upon year, and hopefully this can become a tradition that we do in the city of Kingston. Uh, so I, I, I don't think I see any nays here. Uh, so, but thank you though for those of you who do uh, vote for this motion in helping Kingston maintain its role as being a climate champion. So thank you all very much. Okay, we'll call the vote on new motion number one. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. New motion number two, moved by Councillor Glenn, and Councilor, seconded by Councillor Shays. Whereas the city of Kingston is experiencing a housing shortage like many other communities in Ontario and in Canada. Whereas part uh, 9.1 of the Ontario Municipal Act 2001 contains provisions permitting municipalities to impose a tax for vacant units that are classified in the residential property class and that are taxable under the Act for municipal purposes if designated by the Minister of Finance through regulation. Whereas other municipalities in Ontario, such as Ottawa, Toronto, and Hamilton, have implemented or are considering implementing a vacant residential tax in order to encourage property owners to rent or sell unoccupied units that could increase the supply and affordability of housing. Whereas city staff have been reviewing options for moving discounted property tax rates for commercial and industrial properties that are currently assessed in vacant and excess land property tax subclasses, and will be reporting back to Council in the spring of 2023 on this work. Therefore, be it resolved that Council directs staff to review options for a tax on vacant residential units, including an analysis of best practices, and report back to Council in the spring of 2023 on the feasibility and viability of implementing such a tax for potential implementation in 2024. Councillor Glenn, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, through you. Um, I've had a lot of questions come forward about why I'm moving this motion and why I'm doing it at this particular point in time. So the most pressing issue that we're facing aside from the environment, which we've just finished discussing, is the housing crisis. So I think it's contingent upon us as a city and as a council to make sure that we check into every potential available option for increasing housing stock. And as I've been conversing with people, I wanted to change the tenor of the conversation we're having. Because we talk about units, we talk about housing, but what we don't talk about enough is what we're actually doing, which is providing homes for people. And so this is really at the heart of this motion, 
that what we're looking to do is to provide homes for people. And if we've got available residential property that is sitting vacant, um, this is a movement to urge people to do something with that property. Live in it, rent it, sell it, develop it, but do something with it to contribute to the solution. Because we have to work together as a community. So there's been a lot of concern that this is posed as a tax. Well, the reality is, if you're using that property, you're not going to be taxed. So this is an urging of the community to look at it from that sort of lens and that sort of framework that we're asking you to contribute to the solution. Um, additionally, I've been asked, well, who is this actually aimed at? And I'm going to clear up a few things. This is not aimed at our snowbirds. I understand a lot of people are you know, looking forward to going to Florida in the winter, taking a few months off. So that's not what we're trying to do here. It's for the properties that sit vacant month after month after month, and they cause concern in our communities. As I campaigned, I saw some of those in my own district, and I've heard from others about empty vacant properties in their districts, and they're wondering, why are they sitting vacant when we have people who can't afford a home? And we're not just talking about our homeless populations, we're talking about the people who couch surf, we're talking about the uh, young families who can't get a home. We're talking about people who are working but unable to get into the rental or the um, home market. So we have a lot of people that we're trying to accommodate. The city's been building rapidly, and yet we still have a persistently low vacancy rate. So this is a way to urge people forward. Now, right now, the motion before you is to have a look at what kind of a program can we bring forward. We're fortunate to have had a couple of other major cities begin these efforts, and staff is being directed to go back and have a look at what are the best practices, have those conversations, what's going to work for our city. I recognize we're not as large as some of the municipalities that have piloted this, but I don't think that that should hold us back from moving this forward. One of the other questions that I've had posed to me, are you trying to raise money for the city for housing? Well, <laughs> given the size that we have here, we'd have to have an awful lot of vacant properties to build a lot of new housing. The reality is it costs a lot of money to build simply one unit, hundreds of thousands of dollars. But what is it going to cost us to open up an already available unit? Not nearly that amount of money. So that's why I think that this is hugely uh, a, a positive step. The other thing is we're getting conflicting information on what is actually available in the community. Um, some people are saying, well, there's only a handful of houses actually available. Other people are saying we've got thousands. So I think this is also going to give us data, and that's important. When we're trying to make good decisions about where we move along in this um, journey to create housing for everyone, we need to have that information. What do we really have available? What can we really make use of? And without that data, I don't think we make decisions that are nearly as good. I think this is also going to op open up some other opportunities. So one of the things that's been floated, and you'll be hearing about that shortly, is the potential for head leasing. And so maybe that's a potential opportunity that we're gonna see come forward. Um, but we won't know until we know what's available. So that's why I'm bringing this forward. Um, so I'm going to ask everyone to hopefully support this. Let's get the information. Let's get the data. Let's see if we can provide a home for someone, because I would love to see that in our community for us to move forward something that's actually going to um, really generate some positive change in short order, because it takes a long time to build. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Toso? I thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, I, I will support this motion. I think that the, it, because I, uh, there, oh, okay. there is a portion of people who buy houses and they treat it like a casino. They buy it, they sit on it, they wait for it to appreciate or depreciate in value. It's unfathomable to me with my home that's mostly owned by a bank, but that is a real occurrence and I'm curious of the data to find out how much that is an issue in Kingston. I will say that one thing I'm, I will look for from staff is the analysis of best practices as well as the operational cost of us to actually do something about this because that a good intended program is only as good as it can be as the follow-through can be and 
as good as the intentions are of this motion, and I, I'd like to see it in place, and I want to see what other municipalities are doing, how we actually incentivize people to take those vacant properties and put them on the market or open them up for rent will be the devil of the details here of when the report gets back. So uh, staff, if you are going to do this, no, don't just look at best practices, but actual operationally, how well does this work? Because we might spend a lot of resources and staff resources, and ultimately, like if we get five more units on the market with a lot of extra work, might not be worth the, act, the, the actual cost of this. I just want to make sure we're getting good bang for our buck for getting staff resources behind this. We have finite resources. Um, I do support this motion, but the operational side of this is going to really wear, be where of value to me, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ostroff. Thanks, Mayor Patterson. And um, yeah, I, I can't support this uh, motion and I'm not even sure I can articulate um, myself well enough. Um, some of the concerns are, are what you bring up. And though I, I suppose the data will be, I suppose the data, always, data is always good. Um, so I want to speak to that. But um, I, I kind of feel like this is a no-go zone for us as council right now. Um, I just don't think, uh, I know that some people, people spoke against it. A lot of us got letters on that. Uh, I'm glad to know that, uh, you know, snowbird homes are not um, intended in this kind of scope. And I've, I've never really thought a lot about uh, how many homes. I, I gotta believe it's a low number. So I do wonder about staff resources. Uh, but there's something else about it that um, really bothers me uh, is that we, we as councillors have a lot of responsibility here. And until we get our house in order as a city, how do we want to, how can we look uh, at, at homes and, uh, and, uh, and say that we, they have to now be penalized? It speaks to um, the, the viability already in the therefore of implementing such taxes and potential implementation. This, I find that really almost offensive in a sense, you know, for, for that when we have not done our job well enough in this city, in my opinion, we, we turn down in the rural area, we have uh, provincial policy that absolutely handcuffs uh, homes to be built. You know, th thousands probably, but uh, many, many homes. And so how do we fix that? You know, um, and in, in this city, you know, we've, we've just turned down, a, a, I believe, a viable development where 5,000 people could live. You know, we, we, we really need to uh, look and get our house in order before we start looking at something. You know, I can't imagine, <laughs> you know, if there even be 100 homes in this way. Um, so uh, that are sitting there, that wouldn't be very wise. So I, I just think that we need to think about this one and, and not task our staff any further. And, um, you know, do we penalize ourselves? Because we really do find it. We want, to, we want to penalize by taxation, then we should find a way to penalize ourselves for, for just not having the vision and the insight and the wisdom to uh, make housing happen, the intensification that we could do. We make it impossible for some developers to get the housing built. We make it impossible. And I know this for a living fact. And so we can do a lot better. And so I think that we have to look at our own failures uh, uh, before we uh, go beyond what is um, uh, what we should be doing. And I think it's a bit of a precedent. Uh, and I think that uh, I, I don't, I think we have to have better education. And um, um, for the public, you know, we can speak to it, you know, and it'll probably go away on its own, you know. So there, there's a lot of things involved. And I, I just want to make sure uh, that we don't um, go down a, a road that we probably shouldn't be doing for um, the freedom of homeowners today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Your Worship. I would like to bring a friendly amendment, if I may. A friendly amendment. Could I see the yep. amendment first, and then we can decide whether it's friendly? Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> so if I can just see it. If I just see it on my screen. Okay, we're just just working on it. Just give me. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I have a motion to amend, moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Tozo, that new motion number two be amended in the resolve clause by adding, and the potential for housing agencies to head lease some of these vacant units from property owners following best practices, so that it reads, 
Therefore, be resolved that Council direct staff to review options for a tax on vacant residential units, including an analysis of best practices and the potential for housing agencies to head lease some of these vacant units from property owners and report back to Council in the spring of 2023 on the feasibility and viability of implementing such a tax for a potential implementation in 2024. Okay, so um, duly moved and seconded. Councillor Stephen, you can speak to it and then we will open up the floor for discussion. Thank you, I hope that made more sense in context. I know just the sentence on its own didn't really. Um, so Councillor Glenn mentioned as well in her opening remarks, um, potential for head leasing here in Kingston. And I just wanna remind everyone that this vote tonight on, on this motion is for staff to bring a report. This doesn't mean we're acting on it. Um, so I just wanna put that out there. Uh, in it, I have questions, sorry, procedural question. I have questions about the original motion, so can I ask those after? We're, yes. we're focused on the amendment now. Yes, correct? so whatever happens okay. with your motion to amend, um, so I've restarted the clock, so no matter what happens, the floor will come back to you, Okay. and then you will have up to five minutes to speak to the main motion, either as amended or not amended. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, I just, you know, we've got uh, your traditional lease where you have an owner who, you know, has a lease with a lessee, and we've got a head lease um, model that exists that has been successful in some places, is my understanding. I know I've read a report from Muskoka. Uh, so there's information out there, and as someone sitting in this role who, again, is looking to help with this housing situation, I think that this is something that we should learn about and consider. Again, it doesn't mean we're doing it or not doing it, but I would like as much information as possible to make a really good choice. Okay, uh, any discussion on the amendment? Okay, so we will call the vote then on the motion to amend. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. So Councillor Stephen, now we're back to the main motion as amended and you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, just a quick question, Councillor Glenn, I'm not sure if you would answer this or staff. But just wondering, someone brought to my attention concern, uh, in addition to the ones you've already mentioned, about staff hours working on a report like this. And so I'm wondering who the staff might be. Is this a finance thing because it's tax related? Is this a housing thing? Um, so just wanted to confirm what staff might be impacted by this motion. Uh, Ms. Kennedy. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, yes, um, through finance, through our taxation services division, we are actually already scheduled to bring a report back to council, back to administrative policies committee, probably on June the 1st, I believe is the date, um, to look at options for eliminating the discounted tax classes that we currently have for the commercial and industrial uh, vacant and excess land properties. Um, so that's already been in the works. Um, so we uh, we're comfortable with just adding this piece on on to that report um, and bringing whatever data we can sort of get and, and some of the research um, that we can do between now and, and uh, that meeting um, and just include it as part of that report. So it'll be mainly done through uh, our taxation department, um, but also certainly uh, with support, uh, particularly from uh, the planning department as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as we've already discussed many times, I think that we need a multi-prong approach. Um, I think that getting this information report can provide us with more data, which we know is a good way to drive decision making. And we don't have all the information on this at this time. So I think that it's, I think it's in our best interest uh, to vote for this motion and then see what comes of that and then make that future decision at a later time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next is Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I guess, firstly, my first question would be, does anybody even have any idea what number of units or homes we're talking about with this? I know that the motion seeks to clarify that, but are we going to spend, you know, 100 staff hours looking at 50 units? Does anybody have any preliminary information on that? Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. So, um, Councillor, no, we don't have any information. We have been looking at some of the data through um, uh, Statistics Canada. 
Um, and But we don't have at this point, we haven't had time to sort of drill down to see what it is. So we really don't know what the scope is. I don't expect that will take a lot of staff time um, to at least gather some of that data. There's also been a couple of reports that have been done in the other larger cities that have already been looking at this or have already approved um, to move forward with this. And so there's some of those, uh, some of that data from that those reports as well that we'll be able to utilize in terms of trying to determine the scope of what we potentially could be looking at. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Park. And through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, the other piece of information we do have was just recently released by CMHC, and it's the vacancy um, level um, for uh, vacant units within the city of Kingston. And the data released was reflective of October uh, 2022, and these would be for traditional rental units. And that rate was a 1.2% vacancy rate in the city. Uh, last year, the year before, sorry, October 2021, that rate was 1.4%. So Kingston has a pretty low vacancy rate in terms of traditional rental units. It's the second lowest in the province. Thank you. Thank you. So sorry, just a clarifying question. So, so those are vacant units, but that does not necessarily mean that the that the people who own them are not actively trying to rent them. Is that correct? Uh, that's, that's what it reflects are units that are known to be rental units that are advertised as rental units that are available for rental units. It would not take into account vacant properties that are not being offered for rent. Right, and a healthy vacancy rates around two, 3%, much higher, right? A uh, healthy uh, vacancy uh, rent uh, uh, percentage is at three percent. Okay, thank you. Okay, so so j just in 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 addition to this uh, motion, I, I share definitely some of uh, Councillor to Tozo's comments and and concerns there, as well as Councillor Oosterhof. So I'm, I'm willing to support it to get more information. I guess my biggest fear is that these things kind of take on a life of its own and. Uh, my fear here is that we're not addressing, we're, we're trying to find some small gain um, when really there's a much larger issue at play here. And the much larger issue at play here, uh, Councillor Oosterhoff, uh, you know, started to articulate it and, uh, you know, he's very passionate and everything. And, and, and he's right in the fact that, you know, every time we deny a housing development um, in this city, we contribute to this problem, whether it's 40 units or 500. Um, it is all but impossible to develop in this city. Every single development, I've been on council eight years now, and every development of magnitude has so much pushback that we spend years fighting to, to build homes. So, I mean, I, I, I definitely appreciate uh, where this motion's coming from. It's trying to, you know, find little small ways to fill in the cracks along the way. It does take time to build houses. But we also have to own that. We also have to say we're part of the problem. Um, if we're not going to approve these developments, we can find all these little crack fillers and band-aids along the way, but it will never match up to a housing unit of 1,800 units that, that we don't approve for any number of reasons. I mean, our emails fill up constantly with people who it's always not in my backyard. Well, I would I would challenge each one of us to go and think hard. Where exactly is it that anyone can actually develop in this city a high rise? It doesn't seem that it's anywhere. And so I look at this motion and 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 I'll, and I'll support it because I will get the information, but I think that we have to have a good hard look at what we're actually going to do over the next 4 years as a council to actually say that four years from now, when the next council is elected, that we didn't leave them with this problem because they should be able to say, our vacancy rate's at 3%, it's healthy. And as soon as we build new units, they're gobbled up. So we actually have a backlog. We have we have a, an affordability crisis in this city. And part of that is because we're just simply not approving developments. We're finding every reason and the community is finding every reason. And there's literally groups that they're dedicated to not developing within this city. And they will fight tooth and nail every single development. And I can tell you this, there are lots of great intention developers out there, but they've just given up. They've left. They've said it's not worth it. And you know what? Belleville and Brockville and Cornwall and Gananoque and a lot of these smaller cities are saying, hey, come here and develop. We'll support you. Uh, Cornwall just got Great Wolf Lodge. Do you know how they did it? 
they approached them. They reached out to them and basically said, come here. So if we're going to really get to the bottom of this affordable housing crisis, we have to have a good, lard, a good hard look at our own policies and the fact that a small dedicated dedicated group of 100 people seems to be able to stop almost every major development within this city. And the most frustrating thing to me when I'm reading all these emails is that all those emails are coming from people who are in the comfort of their own home, basically saying no to a development which would give unhoused people houses. And one other factor to consider is that these houses that we would build and even these vacant units are still not going to solve the problems that we have when it comes to the opioid crisis and the homelessness uh, crisis within this city because these homes will still not solve those problems because that's a different type of problem we're trying to solve. So we definitely have our work cut out for us, but every time a major development comes up with 40 or 100 or 150 units, we have to have a good hard look at ourselves and listen to the majority of the people and not the minority because there will be a dedicated group that will always oppose every high rise or every building and every location. And they are vocal and they know how to use the system. But at the end of the day, we're here to represent not just them, but the greater proportion of the population that just want to find a home. They just want something they can afford. And what we call affordable housing nowadays is actually quite unaffordable to most people. 30 seconds. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, next is Councillor Chase. Thank you. So prior to running for council, I actually was on the city website, the city YouTube channel, watching council and planning meetings to get perspective. And my understanding is that this year, there were actually more units approved than there was in previous years. And it's quite evident, especially in, throughout my district, there's a large number of units being built in a quite number of different neighborhoods. Part of the problem may actually be attributed to the fact that our population growth has increased by 7%, not two or three that was expected. So maybe we're not keeping up with the number of houses with regards to our population. It's not because they were not approved. This being said, last year I was also told by someone who had concern about the number of housing, the lack thereof, that they were actually looking for a place for their mother. Come to find out that a like 40 units were bought by an out-of-town financial investor and we're leaving them empty so i think this is what this motion addresses and i think it's important to support this motion for that main fact there we can't have people especially when they're outside of town who have money to sit on to leave units open and not able to have other people who are looking for housing to have that opportunity to either buy or rent Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I support this motion uh, about the vacant home tax. Uh, as the motion says, Toronto started it January 1st. Um, they have had to extend the deadline, and there's been lots of articles in the Toronto Star written about the tax. Um, that said that um, Vancouver's had it for a while and they were a, they saw a 36% drop in the properties that were left vacant because everyone then started filling their properties to avoid paying the tax. Uh, with Toronto, it's uh, too early to determine, but they do have a huge list of exemptions. And so for the two emails that we received yesterday um, saying don't support this tax, maybe their fears will be alleviated because they'll fall in those exemptions. And I'm sure when we get the options, get the data, you know, a list of exemptions um, will be in there just like they're uh, listing them out for Toronto. So I do support this motion. Um, also too, in case someone says to us, hey, I see that Toronto has started it. How come Kingston hasn't? Then at least we're gonna have a report to refer them to, right? So that then they'll be able to understand uh, why we're gonna make whatever decision we're gonna make when that report comes and uh, the, that will better their understanding. And about the housing crisis, uh, there was a really good opinion paper written by the mayor of 
of Aurora, which is in the GTA. We're not the only ones that, you know, want a good development in our city. And so the mayor of Aurora, um, he wrote in his article just a couple of weeks ago that if the developers actually followed the official plan, they wouldn't even need to come to planning committee, right? If they just developed within the official plan to six stories, nine stories, you know, not asking for the world and doubling what's allowed in our official plan um, that could, you know, uh, streamline all the development applications, you know, loosen up the red tape. So I don't want to get into that discussion tonight, but I just thought it was fitting from some other comments that we've heard tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just say as chair, I debated on to what degree did it restrict the debate and discussion on this motion. We are talking about a staff report to do a vacant homes tax. That being said, I know that the housing issue as a whole is important. So I've let it go. Um, I think it's all fair comment. Um, but anyways, I just wanted to explain my, my ruling on that. Is there anybody else that has not spoken to this motion that wishes to speak? Councillor Glenn, you have the last word. Uh, thank you, and thank you to my colleagues for all their uh, thoughtful comments. I think we're all uh, very concerned about the housing issues. Um, I would like to um, make a polite observation. We have a, a very brand new council with eight new members, and I understand past frustrations. Um, but give this council, the new council, an opportunity to help fix the issues that are in front of us. I think that we have that um, option available to us. And, you know, in terms of moving this motion, I didn't expect this to fix the housing crisis. What I expected of this is hopefully to get a report back from staff that might move us a little further forward, that might get us a few um, more units out there on the market, that might encourage those people who are sitting on things to join us in correcting the situation. It's not meant to be punitive. It's meant to be a wake-up call to our community that we can't do this all by ourselves. Um, so, you know, um, I appreciate Councillor Osanic bringing forward the, uh, the comments and the uh, reports on Vancouver and Toronto. I think they're certainly educational. Vancouver is very much a different market from us. But that being said, if we can get even a fraction of what they've gotten, um, we're going to see people in homes um, a lot sooner. I'm going to go back to the comment I made originally. Building takes time. It's not just getting the approval process. There's shovels in the ground getting the building up, um, whereas something that's already built can be made useful um, in a lot faster fashion. So um, I'm going to uh, not continue to go on and on about this. Um, however, my, my final comment is about this being a small thing. Uh, our last motion was about something small and what a good impact it can have. So why can't this small motion have that same positive impact? So thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. So we'll call the vote then on new motion number two. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries by a vote of 12 to 1. Councillor Osterhoff opposed. Okay, we have no other new motions. Are there any notices of motion to present? Okay, seeing none, Madam Deputy Clerk, ask for minutes, please. Moved by Councillor Stephen, seconded by Councillor Hassan, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 4-2023, held Tuesday, January 17th, 2023, special City Council meeting number 5-2023, held Tuesday, January 19th, 2023, special City Council meeting number 6-2023, held Tuesday, January 24th, 2023, and special Council meeting number 7-2023, held Tuesday, January 31st, 2023, be confirmed. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have some tabling of documents, number of communications. Is there any other business? Seeing none. Um, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, do we have a, a motion then to move back into Committee of the Whole? Yes. Just a consent. Can I have the consent of council to move back into Committee of the Whole closed session? Okay, thank you very much. We'll see you upstairs. Um, yes, thank you. So uh, can we say we'll reconvene uh, in 10 minutes, uh, 9.15 upstairs.
Okay, folks, if I can just get everyone to just grab their seat, we will just do what we need to do, and then we will be able to get out of here. So, we have quorum. Thank you, Councillor San. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, first we need a motion to rise from committee of the whole closed session. Uh, Madam Deputy Clerk. Okay. Uh, move by, by, yeah, go ahead, Madam Deputy Clerk. Moved by Councillor Amos, seconded by Councillor Tozo, that Council rise from the committee of the whole closed meeting without reporting. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. So we're now back in open session. Madam Deputy Clerk, ask for bylaws, please. Moved by Councillor Ridge, seconded by Councillor Stephen, that bylaws one through three be given their first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Moved by Councillor Ridge, seconded by Councillor Stephen, that bylaws one through three be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. And that's it for bylaw readings, Mr. Mayor. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor Ridge, seconded by Deputy Mayor Chinani. All those in favor? Opposed, and we are adjourned. Thanks very much, everybody.